And we do these every single Friday. And uh, if you guys are just tuning in for the first time, thank you for joining. Uh, what this course is for and the purpose of this course is to provide financial education. Okay, meaning that, that if I'm watching this, I understand money, I understand investing, I understand wealth building, I understand debt, I understand savings, I understand taxes. So our topic tonight is, should I invest in my 401k? Last week, we hit top financial concerns for Americans. The week before that, we hit really uh, how to set goals for 2020. And so this week, I want to start actually hitting some of the pitfalls. Some of the things that I remember doing that I, I thought were well-intentioned, but after I started learning more about them, I realized that it wasn't actually helping me towards my financial goals. So tonight, should I invest in my 401k? Now, to give you a really quick backstory, um, I have never actually worked at a job where a 401k was offered. Lexi had one at one point, she was contributing to it. Uh, and so when we started learning more about the 401k plan and what it actually does, we had her stop contributing, we pulled the money out, we didn't use it anymore, right? Now, part of my backstory is I was actually a financial advisor for a while. So I was selling 401ks, I was selling mutual funds, and, and I would sit down with people and I would consult them on their retirement. And I would say, here's your retirement number, you need to put this much into your 401k. I would tell people put 15% in it and then put the rest into their Roth IRA uh, or, or whatever other plan they had. And basically what I would see is these people would build up money, get in the 401k, they'd build up money, and then a market correction would happen and they'd lose 20 to 30% of what they had in there. And, and regardless of that, they were still paying fees for that to happen. So you could see as the broker that sold it, the years that I sold it to them and it did well, I was like, yeah, I did that. Okay, the years where I sold it to them and it lost, I was kind of like, oh, like, don't worry, it'll come back. But in my head, I was secretly hoping, like, I hope it really does come back, right? So the 401k, just to give you a little bit of history and backstory on it, it has only been around since 1979. Okay, so it's not been that old. Uh, my dad was born before 1979, which means the 401k is not even as old as my dad is. Uh, you probably have people that are watching right now that are, are born uh, sooner than 1979. You've been around longer than the 401k has been. Right, so to put my life savings and my entire financial future into something that hasn't even been around for, for 50 years, kind of sketchy, just from that standpoint. Now, the guy that invented it, his name is Ted Benna. Okay, Ted Benna, and Ted Benna invented the 401k just for his employees. It wasn't supposed to be this gigantic national thing. It was just for his company. Okay, so he created a plan, and all there was was one fund. It was called the equity fund. His employees could put money into it. That was it. Now, Wall Street got a hold of it, and now it's turned into what it is today. And when I say Wall Street, I mean the, the financial firms, the, the brokerage houses, the stock trading companies, all of these guys that are selling retail financial products. They saw the 401k as the opportunity to increase sales and revenue. Rightfully so. We live in a capitalist world. We live in an economic planet. They're actually looking at this as a business tool for them to make money, not as a retirement plan for you or for me, right? So that's a little bit about the 401k. Now, in order to really understand it, I wanna dive into some facts. All right, so the first one I wanna dive into, who has heard of tax deferral? When you put money in a 401k, I'm able to write off my taxes, defer them, uh, and not have to pay tax on whatever I've contributed. One of the main benefits is I can put my money in there and it's gonna reduce my taxes. Now, I wanna simplify this tax deferral means that I pay my taxes on my income later instead of now. That's all that means. It's not fancy. It's not special. That's all that means is I'm going to pay my taxes later instead of now. Now, I want to ask you a question. Is that naturally always a good idea? It depends on what you're going to pay. Am I going to pay less now or I'm going to pay less later? Right? So this idea that tax deferral is automatically a good thing, it's really situational. It's really, I've got to look at, am I going to pay more taxes today or, I'm going to pay, or I'm, I pay more tax tomorrow? And I need to make the decision based on that. Now, I'm going to give you some data tonight that really made me think when I saw it and I was like, shoot, maybe I would rather just pay the tax today, right? But that's one of the main things people do to get the 401k uh, uh, started up is they say, hey, I'm going to deduct this off my income. And you're not really deducting it. You're just deferring it. I'm deferring it off my income and it's going to lower my tax bracket. Now, the other one is the fact of capital gains and income tax. So there's two different types of taxes I'm paying if I'm investing. If I am investing 
as a long-term investor, I'm going to pay a long-term capital, long capital gains rate. Okay, long-term capital gain means that I held an investment for more than a year and I sold it for a profit. If I held an investment for more than a year and I sold it for a profit, my rate is 15% for the average person. If you're like super high income bracket, you might be in a 20%, right? But that's a long-term capital gains rate. So normally when I buy an investment, when I purchase an asset, I sell it after a year, that's my rate. The problem is if I'm putting money into a 401k, I'm deferring my capital gains tax. Instead of paying capital gains tax, I'm going to pay income tax. So I'm deferring the capital gain. It's staying inside of a tax sheltered vehicle. That's one of the benefits is, is the continuous, it grows and it's not taxed the entire time it grows. The problem is when I pull it out, I'm not paying this bracket, I'm paying income tax. My income tax might be 25%. So I'm paying a higher rate on the entire amount instead of paying a lower rate on the entire amount. Something to think about and consider. The other one here is that you are investing the money with Wall Street. Traditionally with a 401k plan, and I haven't seen a, a company do this yet, Traditionally with a 401k plan, it's always with Wall Street. Granted, and we'll dive into this tonight, you don't have to do Wall Street. There are other options. You can do self-directed 401ks. Most companies don't though. So you're going into a 401k that was usually sponsored by a Wall Street firm. Okay, a financial advisor sat down with my employer and said, hey, let's set up something for, for the team. Here's the 401k. It's going to be through American Funds or Fidelity or Empower or whoever. And it's going to be with my company. It's going to be with my financial firm. And you're going to buy my financial products and pay my financial product fees and commissions. So you're, you're naturally, I'm investing with Wall Street in my 401k. And then who's heard of the match? The match sounds really good, right? So here's the facts about the match. I am getting a free dollar. Okay, that's, 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 that's the basis. That's what most people think. I'm getting a free dollar. If I do this, I get free money. And I love free money. Free money is a good thing, right? But I'm getting a free dollar from my employer. All right, let's pause there. Jeremy, have you ever worked at a company where the boss just gave away money? No. No. Stocks. Stocks. I mean, that's a little bit different. <laughs> Lexi, have you ever worked somewhere where they just gave money away? Mike, how about you, man? Never. There's no such thing as free money, especially with your boss. Okay, I don't know if you've ever heard what boss is spelled backwards. It's a double SOB, right? They're not giving free money to you. No, there, there's no employer in the world. I am an employer. I would not just give money to somebody. So there's no, like the idea, like, oh, I'm getting free money. Like, let's face reality. There's no such thing as free money. There is always a catch. There's always a catch. So what's the catch here? I'm getting a free dollar from my employer by paying a dollar in. So there's the catch. In order to get a free dollar, I had to give up a dollar. Jeremy, did I really get a free dollar if I had to give up a dollar to get it? No, and actually what I was trying, wondering if that actual money comes from the, your company or from the investment company. Yeah. So the match, you mean the match? Yeah. Yeah. So the match usually does come from the company, from the employee, the, the sponsor. So, so let's say, let's say that, um, let's say I start a, a 401k plan for Mike. Mike's an employee at Wealth Dynamics. And I tell Mike, hey, Mike, if you put in a free dollar into my 401k plan, you're, you're going to get a free dollar. Okay. Now realize that Mike had to give his dollar to the 401k in order to get one back. So that's not free. That was a dollar for dollar exchange. That's a net gain of zero. Not only that, I would, I would argue that it's actually a negative because Mike, Mike doesn't have access to either of the dollars now. So Mike gave up a dollar to get a dollar he doesn't really get. You guys tracking with this? Like this is, this is the way you've got to break this down. So I'm giving away a dollar to get a dollar. I don't get either of those dollars back till I'm 60. Right. If I'm not vested, I might not get any of that. I've got to stay there typically three to five years to be vested. Right. So, so that's the whole free match thing. I'm going to dive more into this. Another fact is that you will pay fees to Wall Street. I will pay for Wall Street to manage my money every single year. All right. Who else in the room feels like manage is one of those like kind of blanket terms? Like, what does that really mean? Right. I, 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 when I was a kid, I used to move stuff around uh, with my brothers. My dad was a carpenter and painter. 
And so sometimes when I wasn't feeling it, I would stand on a corner and pretend I was lifting. Really, they were lifting and I was just holding the corner. And I feel like manage is that. There's not really a whole lot of work going on behind managing the 401k plan. I think it's one of those things where it's like, man, I've got to manage billions of dollars in assets. Really what that means is I click buttons and look at a screen for a couple hours a week. It's not hard work. So I'm paying fees for that to happen. And there's no guaranteed result off of this. It doesn't say manage it into a gain. It just says manage. I'm going to manage the 401k. It doesn't say I'm going to manage it into you being profitable. And then last fact is that I don't get my money till I'm 60. Okay, so, so think about um, uh, the average life expectancy. What are they saying is average for, for Americans now? It's like 75, 80? Okay, it's like 80. Let's say it's 80. So, so that means that I'm giving up half of my life. I'm going to work when I'm 20, let's say. And I'm going to contribute till I'm 60 so that I can use the money from 60 to 80. Which half was the better half? I would prefer to have that probably from 20 to 40, ideally the entire thing. But if I had to pick one, it's not going to be the last half. It's going to be, man, I want money now. I want money before I, I, I turn 60 so I can travel and enjoy things. I'm going to have kids and experiences and all this stuff that I would rather have that money for then. But I can't do that if I put it in the 401k and it's deferred and locked up till I'm 60. Right. So these are some of the facts. And you might know these facts as tax deferral. Right. It sounds sexier when you just say tax deferral, but it's not simple. When you break it down, it means pay tax on my income now instead of, or on my income later instead of now. Tax deferral sounds a lot less sexy when we say it that way. The other one is tax deferral on my gains. Sounds super cool. Oh, your, your, your money grows tax free. I'm never paying tax on it. But it doesn't sound sexy anymore when we simplify it and say, yeah, I'm deferring my capital gains tax and converting it instead into income tax. Or when they say invest, and then I'm like, oh, that sounds awesome. We simplify invest with Wall Street. What does that really mean? It means that I'm going to give my money to the most dishonest group of people. And this is not a, a, a false claim. Like, go look up literally every single criminal thing that happens financially happens on Wall Street. All of them. Every crash, they caused it. Most of the wars, they were involved. Right. So this is like the financial mafia. These are not good people. These are not people that you should be having over to Sunday dinner after church. And, and they're going to sit down and talk to you and your kids. They want your money. And they will sit around and, and figure out how to get it. And they'll continue to get in trouble. And if you don't believe me, just go Google uh, uh, Goldman Sachs, Lehman Brothers, all of these companies in 2008. Go Google what they did before 2008 happened. Okay, you'll be sick to your stomach when you see some of the stuff that even uh, Goldman did. Goldman is still around kicking, right? And, and they had, there's a, a fund that they had that literally like they're on document saying, this thing's a piece of crap. We need to sell it more. How many investors can you get this week? This is all documented in emails. Now the financial advisor that answers that phone call doesn't know that, that or that, that, that calls his client. The client doesn't know that that's what's being pitched. The advisor usually doesn't either, but the guys that built the fund know that 100%. But because of marketing, it looks really attractive and sexy. When I invest with Wall Street, I'm buying an invisible share of nothing. That's it. It's, it's not ownership in a business. If I show up to Apple and I tell them I own shares, they're still going to have security walk me out. They're not going to be like, oh, yeah, you own this. Go talk, to, go talk to Tim Cook. My ownership means nothing. I can proxy vote. That's really cool. They're not going to listen to my vote, though. They're listening to the majority stakeholders, right? So I'm investing in, in a company where I own minority ownership in nothing. It's invisible. It's overpriced. It's overvalued. It's under earning. And basically, it, it doesn't have any guarantee of anything. So when I break that down, that's also a lot less sexy. The match, get a free dollar by giving up a dollar. That's also not sexy. See, really simplify is what I'm getting at here, guys. And so when you do that, it really comes down to, all right, what are the things that we're buying into that aren't true? Okay, so the first one is that my 401k is free. Who has sat through? Anyone sat through the HR meeting before? It's kind of like they go through the benefits and the 401k is the one where it's like, they're like, hey, you might as well do it. Just get the match because it's free. It doesn't cost you anything to do the 401k, right? Now, the 401k is not free. Doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that I paid something when I signed up. When I, teach, when I teach on 401ks, I teach on fees. So I break down how the fees work. And when I break down the fees, it's not free anymore. 
it's beyond free. And it's actually genius. It's from a business standpoint, if I am Wall Street, this is a genius system. I get recurring revenue from Jeremy and Lexi and Mike and everyone else in the room, everyone else online. And they're going to stick that into my plan every single month off their paycheck. And I'm going to pull something off the top. They don't know about it because they just see this big basket of confusion and mutual funds and shares and this and that. And they have no idea what's actually going on in there. So they don't even notice the fees. Yeah, they're disclosed in, a, in, in an 85 page document that nobody's going to read, but it's not free. It's the furthest thing from free. Right. So when it comes to finances, when you're working with financial institutions, this is my attitude. I want you to have it too. When something is free, it's usually the most expensive. If something is free, it's usually the most expensive. The free is how they get you in the door, and then you cannot get out the door. So think about it. I sign up for the free 401k. How hard is it for me to get my money out if I decide I want out early? Jeremy, you know, right? It's impossible. You got to go through some hoops to get money out of the free 401k. That's not free, right? Now, the other one is the match is free. We went, we went over that. That's a myth. The match is not a free. The match is not a freebie because it costs you a dollar to get it. I'm going to break down even more stuff behind the match. When I, learned, when I learned what a match really was, I was disgusted. I was like, ugh, like we don't offer one here. We don't offer a 401k, and I'm going to show you why. The other myth is that it's had good growth. Okay, I hear this a lot. People, when I talk to them, the, the, almost one of the final justifications that, that I've heard, and this was my mentality too, yeah, but it's doing well hasn't had a bad year. It's been good so far. This year, it's up this, it's up that, it's up 15, it's up 20. These are the things I hear. Now, I want to break down again, what does good growth actually mean? Okay, like growth, meaning that the money actually went up, then what would you consider to be good? Okay, does good mean five? Does good mean 10? Does good mean 15? Does it mean 20? Does it mean not only growth, but what's the associated risk? What's the cost? So good entails a lot more than just my, my little graph on my fidelity statement went up this month. Next one, my 401k provides good tax benefits. That's another myth. It's not a good tax benefit. This is actually when I pull money out of a 401k, I will pay two to three times more in taxes than I would have paid if I just ate the money up front and paid taxes on my income. And I'll, I want to break down just again, stable like information. This is how taxes work historically. And I'll show you tonight why your taxes actually go up upon withdrawal. The other one is that I should do my 401k because everyone else does it. This is the usually the last one I hear, like the tap out, but everyone else is doing it. All my employees do it. All my coworkers do it. My friends do it. My family does it. It's one of those things kind of like the, the, the go to college, buy a house, get good grades, like all the things you should do. You have to really look at like, should I do this? Is this something that I should do? Is it good for my future? Not is it good for everyone else's future? Because I'm not everyone else. So my financial plan for me personally does not revolve around me being wealthy when I'm 60 and waiting till then. And, and my plan for my clients doesn't revolve around them waiting till they're 60 either. So if everyone else is doing it and everyone else is waiting till they're 60, by the way, the guys that are waiting till they're 60, they're running out of money by the time they're 70, 75. No one's talking about that. But the guys that are waiting till they're 60, they're not living wealthy. Even once they retire, they're not living wealthy. That's, that's 10 to 15 years of terrified living like on a fixed income, hoping, and this is a, 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 just a gross mindset, but this is what the 401k does, hoping I die before my money runs out. Could you imagine like people actually live that way? And I'm not putting those people down. I'm saying, guys, this is a real mindset. I have met people that they hope they die before the money runs out. That's not like when I sit down with you, that's not what, what's inspiring for me as your coach to be like, yeah, let me help Sue live just, just long enough for the money to run out. That's, that's not like why you did all of this. I want you to think back to when you were like 10, 15, 20 years old, 30 years old, just getting started. You weren't like, oh yeah, yeah. My, my goal is to give my, all my money to wall street. And, and then hopefully when I get it back from them, when I'm 60, it's still there. And then I die before it runs out. That was never your goal. So why did it change to that, right? And then the final one is that it's the only option that I have or know about. This one might be valid, okay? The 401k is a financial product. It's heavily marketed to you. Uh, and so it might be the only thing you're aware of. And I hope to fix that myth tonight so that you can leave tonight 
at the very least saying, okay, I know there's other options. I don't have to do the 401k. Because I'll tell you, wealthy people don't max out their 401ks. There's a reason why, why, why when you look around, like they own real estate, they own businesses, they own things that you can't put in a 401k. And even if they did max the 401, they're doing like what, 18 grand a year, 19 grand a year. That's not very much money compared to what they're making, right? So, so I have to stop looking at what is everyone else doing and, and what are the blanket statement tax benefits and what has good growth been over whatever time frame that is and getting free money and, and free benefits. And instead, I need to look at who am I, where am I going, what's my plan, where, when is that plan supposed to happen, and where do I need to be making my moves to get to that destination? And does the 401k fit into that? And if it doesn't, then it doesn't matter what everyone else thinks and what everyone else is doing and all this stuff. I need to do what's right for me. And, and that's really what I did is I took a look at like, what's my future look like? It didn't look like any of this matched up. So I just didn't do it. And that's what I'm saying to you tonight as well. So let's break down costs. Who here likes numbers? I like numbers. I'm a numbers guy. I think everyone in the room is a numbers person right now. If you're online and you don't like numbers, I want to make this really simple for you. And if you're online and you love numbers, you're going to love this anyways. So let's break down costs, right? Now, first things first, I'm going to make this super simple. The 401 costs you money when you put money in. So there's where the first cost is associated. It costs me money when I put money in. All right. Now, this is what's called, and I'm going to get just some terminology on you. This is called a front end load. Stupid, stupid phrase doesn't mean anything. What it means is that when I put money in, they take anywhere from $5.75 off of every $10 I put in or sorry, off of every $100 I put in, all the way down to a dollar. So they're taking one to five, maybe 6% off the top when I put my money into it. Now they don't bill me for this, they just deduct it off my contribution. So I don't usually see that. If I dig through my statement, I might. But if I'm just looking at my account balances and values every day, then I'm not gonna see that money there. So again, they have a front end cost. When I put money in, there is a front end load. They're going to take anywhere from 1% to 5.75% off of every dollar I put in. Second is my 401k costs me money each year. Okay. And this is going to be something where if you have a management fee, uh, that management fee comes off your portfolio value every single year. Sometimes it comes off quarterly. Sometimes it comes off once a year. It really depends on who you're dealing with. This is usually going to be 1% to 2%. Okay, so what that means is if I have a million dollars, that I'm going to be paying one to two percent of that million dollars in that 401k and fees every single year, no matter what. Right, so if you do the math on that, that means that I'm going to pay 10 to 20 grand a year. Now, if I think about what do I actually get from my financial advisor, 20 grand a year, that's like 15, 1600 bucks a month, right? So, so Jeremy, based on like even working with me, would you pay me 1600 bucks a month just for? meetings and calls and be like, here's what your statement says. Here's what we're doing here. Yeah. No, it's not worth it. And, and Jeremy, like he thinks I'm a good guy, but he's not going to pay me that kind of money for that. Okay. If I'm paying 1600 bucks, like I want, I want to, I want someone that's going to grow my business. I want someone that's going to change my life. Not someone that's just going to sit there and be like, uh, money went up. You had a good year. Yeah. Oh no, no, no. Money went down. Wait, wait, it'll come back. It'll come back. Wait three to five years. Right. So that's, that's more expensive than I want to charge. We actually did a course. Uh, what did we come up with on the number? It was like 250 a year in fees that someone would pay. I think it was at the $15 million net worth level. They were paying 250 grand a year in fees. That's astronomical. That's hitman level. Like we said, like 250, you better be hiring like a hitman. Like that's, that's the kind of jobs that guy should be doing for you. Uh, the next one, again, we just said, so, so here's the breakdown. The average cost starts at 5.75, meaning uh, for every dollar I put in, they're taking five cents off the top. That usually that break point where that fee drops is usually going to be about 50 grand. Then it drops to a level 5%. At 100 grand, it goes down to three and a half. At 250, at 500, at 750, and at a million, it finally drops all the way down to 1%. Right? So, so that's called your front end fee. And then your annual fee, again, is one to 2% each year. The annual one is really hard to detect. Okay, you have, your, you have your management fee, you have your 12B1 fees, you have your planned administrative expenses, you have all of these, these um, fees that are actually, there's two different statements. You have the pro forma, and then you have the statement of additional information and disclosures. 
So the fees should all be in the perform, but they're not. There's additional information and disclosures. You actually have to read through this like 20 page packet with little six point, uh, point font and find out what are all these other fees adding up to for you. But it's gonna be somewhere in this ballpark, right? Now I did the math on this, check this out. I did the math on, I'm 27 now. If I put money into my 401k until I'm 60 and I maxed it out at $18,000 per year until I'm 60, the compounding fees would cost me over $2 million between now and then. $2 million, that's not, guys, this is real math. And I didn't even go off crazy market returns. I said an 8% annual return. So what that means is that that fee itself is costing me not only is it costing me the gross fee, it's costing me what it would have been growing at if the money wasn't coming out in fees, right? So I've got to look at both of those aspects. So the 401k cost is pretty substantial. When I add this up, and this is industry average, you can Google this if you want to, the average 401k management fee adds up to about 20 to 30% of my overall portfolio value over the life of the time I have money in my 401 which is usually 20 to 30 years. So that means that I will pay 20 to 30% of everything I've made just in fees. Now, the next one I wanna go over here is the match. Okay, the match is the one that I get the most fire from people on there. Like, yeah, but the match is free. It doesn't matter if I don't do it, I'm, I'm losing out. They're gonna do it anyways, yada, yada, yada. So this is, this is not Jerry, this is the Center for Retirement Research. Okay, the Center for Retirement Research, they conducted a survey with small businesses. And when they asked small business owners where they get the match from, do you want to know what the answer was? Your freaking wages. Every dollar that's matched, you get a 90 cent wage reduction. Again, it's not free money. So, so if we go back to like the first concept I said was, I'm going to put in a dollar so that I can get a free dollar. I'm not even getting a free dollar. I'm putting in a dollar to get a dollar that was stolen from me and I don't get either of those dollars back. That's not free and it's not a match. That, that match reduced my money that I get paid in my paycheck. They brought that down, right? So it's a 90 cent wage reduction for every dollar matched. Crazy, right? And then the 401k is called deferred compensation. Some of this stuff, we, we really just have to pay more attention. It's called deferred compensation. Okay, deferred means that we're pushing something off. We're putting on a hold for the future. Compensation is my wages. We are deferring my wages. Hence why for every dollar matched, 90 cents of my wages are being deferred. So I'm, def I'm deferring my wages and my employer is also deferring my wages. Both are coming from my wages, right? That has to really click. That's not a free match anymore. That's then I'm losing out on both sides. So I'm, I'm being deferred until a later date, including my match and what the employer is putting in. Now, here's the other one. I was asking initially, I was like, all right, well, why would an employer do that instead? Like, why not just pay me my wage, right? So check this out. They don't have to pay payroll tax on the dollars they match me. So not only, like if they didn't do the plan, they would have to pay me 10% more and they would have to pay payroll tax, which is about seven or 8% on top of that. So they're saving 17% for every dollar they match me. That's not a free match. It's coming at my cost. So they're getting a tax benefit on payroll tax and they're reducing my wages down, right? And then here's the crazy one. If you work for a big enough company, you buy their stock with your 401k. So, so not only are they reducing your wage and getting a tax benefit, you're overinflating the valuation of their share prices by putting your money into their stocks. If I'm a company, like I'm all over that. Now I'm more ethical than that. So I'm not going to do that. But if I'm, if I don't have my ethics in and I'm looking at, man, how can I just make a bunch of money and not pay taxes? That's the way I'm going to do it. I'm going to get you to stick money into a plan where you put your own money into the 401k. I can pay you less, avoid taxes and reduce your wage. And then have you go buy my stock with all the money you just put in that plan. And think about it. There's only three, four parties involved. There's you, the employer, Wall Street, and the IRS. The other three are not looking out for you. You can't really look at Wall Street and be like, yep, they got my back. Okay, the IRS, they steal from me every month, so they definitely don't have my back. For most people, their employer doesn't either, or the employer is just uneducated and can't have their back because they don't know any better, right? So, so this payroll tax thing, like I'm an employer that pays payroll tax, I would enjoy lowering that. Now, I'm more ethical than saying I'm going to do that by stealing from my employees, but that's the reality of what's happening there. 
And then you, the employer, they're going to get the tax deduction either way. They're going to either pay you and write it off as, as a wage, or they're going to do your 401k match and write it off there. So they really don't care. The only difference maker is, well, if I do the 401k instead, I don't have to pay the payroll tax. And I can reduce the amount of money that I did have to give them. Right, so they can pay you less and avoid two taxes or avoid two types of taxes. Why wouldn't they do the match? The other one here is that my 401 has grown well. Okay, I've seen it. Who's who's felt like that before? You look at the market, Jeremy. You probably like, like Jeremy's a guy. He doesn't necessarily believe in the market, but you like we've we've had those years where you look at it and you're like, huh? I was in work for a company in town that did the stock matches. Yeah, and when the stocks went up, boy. You this the 401 went up. Yeah. It's hard to argue with. It's like, huh? Like it went up. Just made $15,000. Thanks, guys. Yeah. And that's that's kind of the attitude is like, well, it's grown, especially especially since 2008. Okay, we have to realize the context of of where we're at. Okay, there's something called recency bias. Recency bias is the attitude that because it's been one way, it will continue to be that way. I want you to realize there there are very few times in the market history where we've seen rips like this, where it went for freaking 12 years. Every seven to 10 years, they say there's a market crash historically. We've gone 12 without a serious one. We've had little dips and corrections, but it always comes back up. So where we're at is not normal. It's uncharted territory. And, and when I studied, when I looked and studied at why the market was up, do you know what I found? Dollar for dollar, for every, every piece of, of money printed into the system by the federal government, the stock market went up. If you take a graph, it's called quantitative easing. Quantitative easing is a fancy term for the government printed money that they didn't have. You take a graph of how much money they printed in 2008 and you lay it up on a graph of the stock market, it is the same exact graph. Like, like, like one to one ratio. It's insane. So when I realized that the market was up because we flooded it with fake money, of course, things feel good when you get a bunch of money, right? But the money has no value. So check this out. The stock market is more manipulated than ever. Okay. If you're watching this right now, I don't know if you realize this since October, our federal government has put a trillion dollars of fake money into the system through banks meaning that they're buying U.S. treasuries from banks so that banks have liquidity because banks overextended themselves once again, and they don't have a way out of it. And so they've got to borrow money from the Fed by selling U.S. treasuries, which is government debt, back to the Fed. So the Fed's buying its own debt, giving fake money to the banks so that the market can keep going up. Okay, because if they didn't, the market would crash. And what do we just say? It's higher than it's ever been. What is that crash going to look like when it finally happens? This is higher than it was in 1929. Meaning that when it crashes, based on that logic, it would be worse than 1929, right? So the market is manipulated 100%. And if you don't believe me there, then let me share with you this. Have you guys heard of high-frequency trading? High-frequency trading is people that get these high-speed connections and they do trades that happen in, in fractional seconds. And what they do is they'll buy, 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 buy on a stock to artificially inflate the price. Me on my E-Trade account, I don't see any of that. All I see is that, man, this thing just went up a whole bunch. I'm going to buy it. As soon as they buy it, guess what? Those guys that do the artificial or the, the high-frequency stuff, they dump it. They artificially jack the price up. The consumer gets in. Some of these consumers, by the way, are fund managers. The guys I gave my money to in my 401k are watching, oh, this one looks good. I'm going to get in. As soon as they get in, the high-frequency traders pull out. They take the gain. The stock crashes. Like this is stuff that, that what I really want to communicate to you is this is stuff that I can't control. I don't even know when it's happening, right? Like, like, like you think about like even uh, Jeremy owns property. Like, are there things like just with owning property where like, there's kind of like, man, I hope, I hope it's going well. Okay. So, and that's with like a tangible, massive object. Okay. Imagine if it's an invisible, massive object and there's more than just tenants living there and anybody can get involved. Like if, if your place was open for squatters anytime, would you be really worried? <laughs> right? But you can do that with stocks. Squatters can cut. They're not committed to it. They're just going to come in, use it, and leave. And they're going to dirty it up and damage it while they're there. So here's another thing I looked at. Companies are earning less right now. They are profiting less. And they are actually worth less, but their share prices are up. So tell me how this, how this works. How does a company earn less money, have less in profit, and have less in actual assets, but the share price doubles. 
I was actually reading it was a, a study on Coca-Cola. And if you want to learn more about this Coca-Cola thing, email me and I can send you uh, the link I was looking at. But they looked at the price earning ratio on Coca-Cola. And they looked at, at basically where it was, I think it was 10 years ago, six years ago, maybe. And between then and today, Coca-Cola ha has a, a lower revenue, lower profit, lower assets, and the share price factually did double somehow. Where does that come from? Because I would buy a company based on revenue, profit, and assets. So if the revenue, profit, and assets are down, logic would say, okay, well, the share price should be down too, but it's not down, it's double. See, so we're not dealing in, in logic here. We're dealing in manipulation. Manipulation means that somebody is in there fixing the numbers. Somebody is in there manipulating. They're making changes that shouldn't be there. I don't want to invest there. No different than food. If you ate food and you know that the, that the, that the cook messed with the food, you wouldn't want to eat with it. Okay, but in retirement investment, like the, the cook, the guy that's actually like putting all this together is messing with my investments and I'm still investing. That doesn't make any sense. So here's the reality as well. So over the last 20 years after inflation, investors have made a 1.7% annual return on average. 1.7% after inflation. That 1.7% has not been taxed yet. And we don't have to dive too deep into the numbers to see that that's the fact. We just said that if I do the 401, 20 to 30% of my money is going to go to fees. Okay, so if I have a pie here and I have 20 to 30% of this pie going to fees, what's an average tax rate, Jeremy? 25. 20 to 30%. So we have 20 to 30% going to taxes. That means that we have 20 to 30% left left but we haven't even included inflation, right? So we have inflation, that's another probably 20, maybe 25. And then I've got one to 2% left for me, right? So that's my retirement pie. You guys see those diversif diversification charts where they're like, here's your, here's your future values. Like this is gonna go to central banks, that's inflation. This is gonna go to central banks, that's taxes. That's gonna go to Wall Street. And then you get the one to 2% on the top. Isn't that great? So guys, this is the reality. And, and I want to go ahead and like bust this myth of, of a lot of us might be watching right now and thinking what I'm thinking of like, well, I have more money than 1.7% than this year. Over the last 20 years, I went back and looked. The highest return during a year was 29.6%. Okay, so that means at some point, one of these guys said, man, I just made 29.6%, but they still averaged 1.7%. So for me to look at my statement and say, oh, it's up 20 this year, so this isn't true, doesn't, that, 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 that's not how it works. At some point over the last 20 years, one of these guys that made only 1.7% at the end of it looked at their statement and said, oh, it's up 29, I'm doing great. But they still walked away with less than 2% returns. So it's not about what it's at today or what it did this year. It's what are you actually getting when you leave the investment? Technically, you're not leaving the investment until you're 60. Now, the tax benefits, let's check this out really quick. And I'm going to speed up a little bit to get through all this. So if I contribute a dollar and I am in a 25% tax bracket, then I save 25 cents in taxes, right? Great. Now, let me just pitch this differently. Let's take taxes out of it because we can get emotional about taxes. Um, Mike, if I sold you cat food that was on sale and you didn't have a cat, would you buy it just because you could save $3 on the price? Okay, so if I don't need that, I wouldn't spend a dollar to get 25 cents I didn't need. And if it's all the same, like just deductions across the board, there's better ways for me to save 25 cents where I actually get my dollar to go to work for me right now. Right. But let's just say that this is a good idea. I'm going to spend a dollar on my 401k to save 25% in taxes. Well, historically, since 1913, taxes have increased by 1.557% per year. Okay, we started with the highest tax bracket at 7%. This year, it's 37. You annualize that, that's 1.57% annually. So I know that that's historically what taxes have done for over 100 years. That means we could use that number to predict what they're going to do in the future. They're going to keep climbing. They're not going down. I have news for you. They can't. Okay, so they're going to continue to climb up. That means that my 25% tax bracket, by the time I am 60, will be 37%. Okay, that will be my tax bracket, 25 to 37% based on that annual increase in the same income. Meaning if I kept every, all my income the same, 
But my hope is that I'm wealthy when I'm 60 and I have more income than I had today. That's kind of the point, right? So if I'm going to have more income, then I plan on withdrawing more money, which is actually if I'm in the highest tax bracket today, which is 37%, that tax bracket when I'm 60 will actually be 60%. It's not that crazy. Like, it, like I just showed you, it already happened. So now if I'm withdrawing at a 60% tax bracket in 25 years, I put in a dollar to save 25 cents to then pull it out and pay 60. Did I really save money in taxes, guys? No, I, I lost, right? I lost almost three times. So I lose out on the long-term capital gains as well. If I would have just done, and, and just to keep it simple, if I would have just done mutual funds, and I hate mutual funds, but just to keep it apples to apples, if I would have just done mutual funds and it was not in a 401k, I would have paid 15% on my sale. Not 25, not 60. I would have only paid 15%. So you'll really have to get rid of the contribute a dollar to save 25 and just look at what did I actually pay? I paid 60. Okay, I could have paid 15. So the tax benefit is really not a thing with the 401. Now, here's the excuses I hear. And, and these are excuses that, that usually, like the first one, I'm going to go and hammer you guys really quick. This, I hear this one way too often. Mike, what did your mom say to you when you did something stupid and you say, everyone else is doing it? Well, you're going to jump off a bridge? You're going to jump off a bridge too, right? So you can't like, that's the first one people come back at me with. Well, everyone else is doing it. Go back to when you were six. Tell that to your mom and find out, like, think back. What would she have said? Well, you're going to jump off a bridge too. If everyone else like, you know, stuck their finger in the light socket over there, would you also do it? So get out of this mindset if everyone else does it. That's not a good reason to do anything. So if we get rid of that. That's not even valid. The mindset usually after that's removed is, well, it's the only option I have. It's the only thing I, it's the only thing I know about. It's either that or I stick the money in the bank and I don't want to put it in the bank. So I'm putting it here. I understand that. This is actually a person trying to make a good decision with the information they have. It's better than the bank. It grows more. I can get tax benefits. It sounds way better, right? But the truth is, it's not the only option you have. I'm going, to show you, I'm going to show you what this looks like. So compared to a program we have called the sacred account, the sacred account is life insurance. Now, I know you're going to be like, oh, life insurance? It's been around for 150 years. Okay, Warren Buffett does it. Rockefeller did it. Carnegie did it. You look back at Teddy Roosevelt. He did it. Walt Disney did it. JC Penney's did it. He has a freaking parking garage right across the street from my office. That thing works. Okay, do some research. But this is life insurance. Now, this is also free. There are no management fees. So the thing that attracts someone to the form, it's free. I can sign up. It's free. There's no fees. There's no fees on this. There actually are fees on the 401k. We don't charge you management fees. We don't charge you front-end load commissions. And, and there's none of that going on. The free match. Now, we do our match differently. Check this out. When you put money into a 401k, we just said that you're putting your own money in there into the 401, losing out on that dollar you just gave them to get a free dollar that was really yours in the first place. They just gave you a wage reduction. That's not free. With ours, you put in a dollar, you can borrow against your dollar and the company will continue paying you on both the dollar you have while you go earn money on the dollar you just borrowed. Mike, is that closer to a free dollar? Yeah. That's much closer to a free dollar because I didn't have to give anything up. They're giving me interest on the dollar I put in and then I'm using an extra dollar to go do stuff outside the account, right? I was talking to someone yesterday about life insurance and, and the guy was like, he, he, I said something and it clicked for him. I said, this is used for real estate. You're not just putting it in life, you're going to pull it out. And he had never heard someone say that before. He's like, wait, so the purpose of life insurance is the real estate? And I was like, yeah, you're using this for real estate. It's just a better place than the bank because that's where you're probably going to put it if you're doing real estate. So put it here instead because you can do that with it, right? Now growth, six to 8% average annual dividend for over, over 150 years in a row. We just looked at over the last 20 years, the market's only done 1.7. What's ironic is if you go back to 1929 and you inflation adjust the returns on the Dow, that's also 1.7%. So you're not earning very much money in the market. We can show you consistently this thing has paid dividends over and over and over and over. Their gross dividend rate is right in that range. It's done that for a century and a half. And then tax benefits. I put my money in and it can never be taxed again forever. And then when I borrow against the account, as long as I'm investing, I'm writing off my interests. 
Those are real tax benefits. Me putting money into a system that can never be taxed again, not me contributing to defer my income to then pay more taxes later, me paying taxes on the seed so that I don't have to pay taxes on any of my harvest. And then deducting the cost of my harvest off on my actual income at the time I use it. And then everyone does it. You've got to look at which group of everyone do I want to be in? Okay, do I want to be everyone that's driving a, a $50,000 German vehicle with a mortgage payment I can't afford nothing in the bank and I'm going to run out of money when I'm 75? Or do I want to look, like, look, look, look at everyone like Walt Disney? And everyone like J.C. Penney and everyone like Theodore Roosevelt, everyone like John Rockefeller and the Rothschilds and all of these crazy wealthy families that we can show you they did this. Right. So different mindset, different system. So the question again on should I invest my 401k? And I want to go over this really quick because I loved the what I think is happening and what's really happening. OK, so the what I think is happening, should I invest in my 401k? is that it's free. What's really happening is that for me personally, I would pay $2 million in fees if I did the 401k. Okay, what I think is happening is I think I'm getting a free match. Really, I had to give up a dollar to get a dollar that was already mine. What I think is happening is that my 401k has grown very well. Really, it's only done about a 1.7% return for the average investor over 20 years after we account for inflation. And then I think I'm getting tax benefits. In reality, I'm paying two to three times more in taxes. I think everyone else is doing it and succeeding. Little do I know, guys, take this, like I'm kind of like a financial doctor. Like I see people's finances, stuff they don't tell you, the stuff that they probably don't tell their spouse. I see it on a day-to-day -day basis. You don't want to be everyone else. Like I see this stuff every single day. I deal with some weird stuff with people's money and I help them get out of it. You do not want to be them and they don't want to be you. You guys should not be, you're both infected. Go find someone that's super healthy and go copy, it, copy them instead. And then finally, is this the only option I have? We just showed you a better one, right? So guys, that is our comparison on the 401k. I wanna open this up for any questions we have. I know we went through a lot. Um, quickly before I do that, action step, stop contributing. Um, I am gutsy enough to tell you, even if you get a match, don't contribute. Most financial people will, will still cower and say, well, if you get a match, at least get that and walk. I'm saying, no, that's, that's cheese on a mousetrap. Don't even go for it. Just be, don't do the system whatsoever. Even if you get a match, do not put your money into it. If you have an old 401k, roll it over. You can self-direct it. You can do real estate, great things with that. We can help you with that. Um, if you don't have an old 401k, then move your funds into safe area. Like let's say you're, let's say you're uh, at a job where you did put money into it. You're actively there and you can't roll it over. Move it into safe funds like bonds, treasuries, cash equivalents, whatever that might be, and just let it ride out till you leave that employer, and then you can go move that money over. Then you start a sacred account, start building that up instead and put it to work actively. That's the difference. The 401k is stick the, mo stick the money in the oven and turn it up to 375 and wait till you're 60. Ours is like grilling. Okay, who likes grilling better than baking? Everyone, right? You're on the grill, like it's active. You like seeing the juices and all the stuff, like that's how the sacred account works. So guys, questions. Do we have any questions here in the room? Do we have any online? Awesome. Do we have any on Facebook here? No. All right, guys. So thank you so much for watching. Make sure you like, share, subscribe. Uh, if you want to tune in again next week, we'll be talking about the next financial pitfall that I want to share with you. Thank you for tuning in. Have a great Friday. We'll talk to you guys next week.